I've heard people say that in John's gospel, we see the divine Messiah, but in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we don't. But perhaps since John was written later, people began to speak about Jesus oh. with this divine sort of authority, and therefore we really shouldn't accept John, and because the other gospels don't talk about him being divine. Why is oh that Oh my false? gosh. Oh, that's so terrible. That's awful. I just... <laughs> I just got back from pilgrimage. You should take some heartburn medicine. And then right, right. Yeah, I have to calm down. I have to like do some centering exercises to calm myself after that incendiary thing that you just said. But uh, th- say your centering prayer word. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Concentrate on the breath. Back to the breath. Okay. Um, Feel but, your body. That's yeah. Africa. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll stop. Look again and again. You, th- this this problem, Matt, arises from not reading the Gospels as Jews. You got to place yourself back in that first century Jewish mindset and approach this from a Jewish perspective. And if you do, you discover that Jesus is claiming to be divine all over the place in all four of the Gospels. Okay, but understandably, being a good teacher, he's subtle about it, and he kind of provides you with enough information to be able to triangulate or figure out that he's God without saying it directly, because if he says it directly, he risks arrest. And it's not that our Lord is unwilling to be arrested. He just wants to be arrested at the right time and on his terms. And so he waits till he's ready for his passion, and then he allows himself to be arrested. But, he's, but, but he's, he controls the situation, right? But let me give you some examples. I mean, a great example is the calming of the storm on the sea, which is recorded by Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Okay. Um, uh, if you go back to uh, Psalm 107, one Psalm 107 has a couple of lines where it says, you know, the Lord using the divine name, you know, Y H W H the Lord calms the sea and, and, and stills the winds. Okay. And, and then you see Jesus doing that on the sea of Galilee and any good Jewish reader, you know, remember the Jews recited the Psalms, memorized the Psalms, any good Jewish reader who reads that account of the stilling of the storm on the sea of Galilee Psalm 107 is going to come to mind and they are going to put two and two together, come up with four. Four is Jesus is God. He is the Lord from Psalm 107. Even if you're a pagan, you're going to realize that Jesus is divine because the winds were the domain of Jupiter and the sea was the domain of Neptune. And those two guys were at least two of the top three gods in the Greco-Roman pantheon. And Jesus has just outranked Jupiter and Neptune by telling them to shut the heck up and sit down and be quiet. Okay. So that means Jesus's power exceeds that of Zeus and Poseidon, you know, Jupiter, Neptune, you know, that Jesus exercises divine power. And this is why it causes fear. And then the disciples are like, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Again, the Sermon on the Mount. In uh, Matthew chapter 5, we have those famous six antitheses where uh, Jesus uh, says again and again, you have heard that it was said or mm-hmm. you've heard that it was written, but I say to you. And in six different places there, Jesus corrects either the interpretation of the law of Moses or in some instances, he corrects the law of Moses itself. Moses was regarded as a divine man or like a theos anair in Greek. They, they call it, scholars call it like a, a man who was almost, you know, was, was so close to God that, that divinity almost kind of flowed through him mm-hmm. in, in the Jewish perspective. So there's nobody higher in the Jewish mm-hmm. view of the world. There's no one higher than Moses, but God himself. So for Jesus to correct Moses in the Sermon on the Mount uh, amounts to a claim to divinity. Okay. And this happens again and again. I could go into, you know, greater detail, but on virtually every chapter of Matthew, Mark, Luke, Jesus is doing things that, uh, that only God can do. And again, being a good teacher, he uses a Socratic method. The Socratic method is to allow people to, as it were, get it themselves. Mm-hmm. And so he's just, you know, not making the blatant claim, but providing folks with enough right. evidence from his miracles and from his teaching that they can figure out what's what's going I'm on. I'm thinking of today's gospel, which is easier to say your sins are forgiven or to right. get up, take up your pallet and walk. 
Right. But so that's you, answer, you tell right. me, and then right. I'll do that thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, he identifies himself as the son of man. Well, you go, you know, mm. who is the son yeah. of man? Daniel mm-hmm. 7 mm-hmm. is the son of man. You go back to Daniel chapter 7, and the son of man comes riding on the clouds. Well, what does that mean? Well, Psalm 18 says that the Lord rides on the clouds. In Greco-Roman mythology, uh, Zeus or Jupiter rode in the clouds. In Norse mythology, it was Thor. In, in all these pagan religions, the chief god always rides on the clouds and controls the weather. So in Daniel 7, the son of man who comes riding on the clouds to be presented before the ancient of days, the son of man is a divine figure. And even Jewish scholars uh, uh, admit this. Uh, there's Daniel Boyarin, a very famous uh, rabbi scholar from uh, UC Berkeley, like uh, 20 or 30 years ago, wrote a uh, wrote an article in Harvard Theological Review uh, pointing out that uh, the Son of Man figure in Daniel 7 is a divine figure, mm-hmm. you know? And this is, so people think when Jesus calls himself Son of Man, that's, that it means like Joe Sixpack or John Q. Doe or something like that, like I'm just a generic human being. That's not the meaning of the phrase. You know, look at Psalm 8 and what it says about the Son of Man. Look at how the Son of Man is portrayed in Daniel 7. Right, so it's if a, you're right about that, I would imagine that we would have a response of horror to the claim, I am the Son of man. Do we see that? Right. Well, uh, we do, you know, at the trial at the Sanhedrin, where um, where the high priest Caiaphas places Jesus under oath and, and says, I adjure you, uh, tell us if you are the Christ. And Jesus says, I am. And I, and truly, I say to you, you will see the son of man coming on the clouds in glory. Okay, this is the divine entrance of the son of man from Daniel seven. And then Caiaphas says, blasphemy. Well, what is blasphemy? It's like, you know, falsely claiming to be God or, you know, offending and so on. And so, yeah, there is this response of horror. But that that could have more to do with the writing on the clouds of glory than just saying I'm the son of man. So if you're right that saying I'm the son of man yeah. means more than I'm a human like you, I mean, shouldn't we see people uh, being bewildered at that statement all throughout? Well, they are, in a sense, bewildered by this this claim that son of man, and people don't seem to understand what he means by that, yeah. but the light comes on when he's tried uh, before the Sanhedrin. And so like, I, oh, the son of man that is, son of man is here. You, this is you. what you've been meaning all this time, you yeah. know? So it's like, yeah, this is kind of great, you know, revelatory moment. For those who had eyes to see and ears to hear, they could have figured it out before, but it finally becomes, you know, a public, public recognition mm-hmm. at our Lord's trial before the Sanhedrin. Hey, thank you so much for watching. Before you go, do us a favor, leave a comment, let us know what you thought of the video, like, and subscribe.